Okay, I think I will get started, we are almost there. So good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, session here. Uh, my name is Tathagat uh, and uh, I work for a company by name Nerd Wallet. We are in personal finance space, so I am I'm setting up the Indian operations for us. We are a San Francisco based uh, company uh, and uh, basically uh, a startup there, so yeah. So today afternoon I am going to talk about super organism mindset. Is a, is a term familiar to anyone? Super organism? Okay. Okay. So we will discover that. Uh, what I mean even if you just come across this term you may not have, you may not uh, know the meaning. What does it, what does it mean to you? Just some random short said it. Powerful. Like a superman, superhuman. Not normal, no restriction. Okay, anyone else? Which can transform? Which can transform? Okay, that's a that's a good perspective. So kind of a shape shifting. It can shape shift itself or something, right? Okay. An organism made of organism, so something that contains something else that is self similar. Okay, so that's a that's a pretty close to what. Uh, uh, maybe I'm sure you would have seen a picture like this. Tom and Jerry or one of the cartoons, right? You, you have a big fish and then it is chasing the small fish but then the small fish decide to do something totally different here. They actually organize into what looks like a big fish and then it scares the hell out of the big fish. You remember watching any of the video cartoons there, right? So as, as you said, this is probably the closest to there. Uh, of course, the other things are right. I think it's, it's a powerful something, no restriction in some sense. So, what, what, what tends to happen is this is not an idea limited only in, uh, in animation cartoons. Uh, it actually happens in nature and uh, we call it as a super organism. So in this talk, I want to discuss with you what is a super organism, what does it mean, what are the characteristics of a super organism uh, and then uh, come back to the human groups and teams. What does it even mean for us? What does it mean to the team? What does it mean to the organizations? What can we learn from there? And uh, can we apply some of these ideas uh, at the workplace, right? So these are some of the things there. So it is meant to be a, uh, it, it is meant to be a, an open-ended uh, talk. Uh, I'm not talking about something that I've done. I'm only talking about some of the ideas that I keep learning about myself uh, and how we can really, that's why it is really, so, so even though the track is agile mindset, in some sense, we are actually talking about a much bigger agile mindset. And that is the whole idea here to really do a very, uh, open-ended conversation about what does it mean and what can uh, what can it uh, do for you, right? All right. So uh, so I'll get started and I want to show you some of the stuff. Forget about the text here; it is not meant to be read. Uh, and sorry about that. The other other slides have only pictures, most of them. So you will see a much more eye-friendly slide. All of us remember watching ants when we were small, right? You drop a drop little bit of sugar and they are all over the place and they will just uh, wipe off everything from the from the kitchen uh, uh, right slab there. Uh, people have been studying ants for a long period of time and uh, some of the very interesting things they have found is that ants are a very resilient creature. By themselves they are very weak. If you leave uh, a, a few ants or a couple of ants or even few hundred ants they will all probably circle and circle, eventually they will die. But you bring a million of these and they will wipe off probably a horse or they will wipe off a human being uh, off the table. They, they, are, they are so aggressive really. So they, they actually get very strong as a group when they are in large numbers, but they are very weak when they are in small numbers. Remember that thing because that's an important perspective to do that. So they are very resilient in the sense if, if the ants are going, and if, you, if they actually find a crack in between, like let's say they are, they are crawling on the table and they see a crack there in the table, on the uh, table uh, uh, surface, they will actually form a bridge here. And the interesting part is nobody tells them that, hey, now is the time, let's have a, let's have a kickoff meeting, let's, uh, let's make a burn down chart, let's do something or let's have a project management uh, workshop or something. They just do that. It seems to be a very natural kind of a thing there. There are tons of videos on YouTube. So if you feel interested, do watch some of them because it's a very, very interesting thing. Within a matter of seconds, literally, the bridge will auto form 
they will start crawling on the top of it. It's a very altruistic nature. Some of the ants are happy to just be the bridge and let other ants walk on them. How many human beings would be willing to do that? Right? We actually have a other name for the, for, for the situation where human beings walk all over you. We call it as office politics. Right? So it's a very different context here. There, is an, there, there are species of ants which actually are very resilient when it comes to uh, uh, being in water. Now again, an isolated ant might, might drown, but if you, have, if you take a million ants, they actually cre become a raft by itself. And they can float and they can go anywhere else there without drowning uh, any of the uh, ants in the process. Uh, the ants have been known to make very complex architectures. This is actually, uh, uh, the scientists, what they do is, because they don't know how the structure inside is, Little, okay, if, if you are an animal lover, you may not like to hear what I'm about to say that. But what they have done is, what they do is they actually pour malted uh, aluminum or a malted metal inside in an ant hill. And then when it cools down, they actually remove it and then they find that actually the ant uh, uh, thing, like you can see, this, this guy is probably six feet and this is extending uh, one and a half times actually. So they make these complex structures and these are not just random structures. People who have studied ant colonies for years, they say it actually is a very, very well um, architectured place. There are places where the young uh, eggs will be, lay, will be hatched. There are places where the young uh, pupa will be there. There are places where even the dead ants will be. Because in nature, there is no concept of technical debt. Technical debt exists only in IT industry. In nature, there is no concept of waste. The waste from one living organism is actually the input for another uh, organism. And have you ever seen any kind of a waste? It just tends to, it's a very transient condition and it just goes and uh, becomes, it disappears because it integrates into another food chain there, right? And, and even the ants actually don't like to see dead bodies of other ants there. So they actually have places in the ant colonies or in the ant farms where these are kept separately there and they get disintegrated uh, over time there. So ants are actually a very, very interesting, very, very smart set of what we call as social animals or social insects in this case. Uh, let's take little more examples of that. Uh, some of these things also uh, show very interesting characteristics of what we call as a self-organizing kind of a thing. That means there is nobody really kind of externally saying do it this way, do it that way. But then magically, we see some of these kind of a things. So this is, this, is a, uh, 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 this is a kind of a green uh, uh, plants here. They all seem to create these fractal kind of shapes, which all are alike. Who's really doing this kind of a molding? Nobody's doing that. Maybe it is en genetically encoded, but then this, they have this kind of a thing where it is self-organizing in nature there. We have a lot of examples of some of this kind of stuff. I'm sure you would have seen this swarm of birds, very common during the summertime evenings, right? You have these millions of birds that, that are going there and they, they actually move like this. Uh, have you watched this, right? If you just look it up in the, in the typically this is the best time in Bangalore, if you just look it up, if you, have, if you have free sky available still in a part of Bangalore where you live, I'm sure you can enjoy that. Now, one of the beautiful things that you may not have noticed but let me uh, mention and, and, and hopefully when I mention it might become a little more prominent to you is if you see these million birds flying together, do you think there is a project manager or a CEO bird here? <laughs> is there somebody who is telling let's go this way or let's go that way? Question number one. Number two, have you ever seen two birds colliding with each other? These are birds flying at random. There is no project plan, there is no Gantt chart, there is no product roadmap, there is no burn down chart that is telling them that this is the direction we are going to do. They seem to have to be what, what we might even call, what Edward de Bono might call as a water logic, right? It is just going very fluidly and yet these million birds don't seem to bang into each other. Very interesting thing there and it, I think it's worth asking what is it that these guys do? I mean. Bangalore, you put three people on an empty road, they will end up banging into each other. But then you have a million birds who are flying without any master plan and they don't seem to have this kind of a problem. So what is so unique about a bird swarm here, right? Uh, this may or may not have seen, I'm sure all of us remember seeing fireflies, at least when we were kids, right? 
uh, and one of the biggest, uh, one of the very interesting thing about fireflies is that fireflies by themselves are just emitting light at a certain frequency interval, right? Maybe every second they are flashing the lights. But if you take a large colony of fireflies, a very interesting phenomena happens which is known as synchronization. So what tends to happen is that when people are, when, when you start it, they are flashing asynchronously, randomly. But within a few moments, they are all flashing at the same time. Now one question, why do, why do the fireflies flash? Anyone knows that? Communicating, Communicating what? Other flies. Okay. Uh, right direction, incomplete answer. Anyone else wants to uh, build on uh, what he said? What did he say? I mean, he said they are communicating. They are basically communicating something. Okay, they won't obviously call the predator. They might be look. They, so, so there are multiple theories. One of the theories is they are just trying to mate. That's a simple biological fact of life actually. They are just looking for uh, uh, the female fireflies to mate. And people say uh, that by flashing enough number of lights. Now the question again, the, we have to see the dichotomy in nature. Why would all the fireflies participate if that was the nature? The reason being, if I am a single firefly I am doing, I can attract uh, the mates for me. But if I am a part of it, it is the, per, the density per unit uh, firefly is getting diluted a lot. So why will I cooperate there? I should be competing, right? A firefly should be competing for a mate, but here a firefly is actually collaborating for a mate. So it's a very different kind of a uh, biological phenomena happening there. There is another thing, another theory that says they actually flash together so that there is enough light for them to be able to see the point you said, termites which are their prey. So they can eat the termites there. Nobody knows it for sure what is the thing, but these are some of the plausible theories here. But important point to remember is, we believe that in biological world, we compete with each other, right? I mean, Darwin's world, world was really all about survival of the fittest. So we are competing with each other. We are all fellow competitors. But here you see one after other examples, instead of competing, they are collaborating. They are working together. They are keeping their self-interest on the back burner, but they are willing to pursue a common self-interest of the larger group there, right? This is a very unique kind of a thing happening there. We'll investigate what does it really mean. Fish vortex, have you seen this kind of a phenomena? A lot of species of fish, when they are trying to protect themselves, they create this very high speed kind of a vortex. And they actually confuse uh, the predator fish. And the whole idea there is that one, the probability of a one single fish becoming a prey is very small because there are now millions of them. And uh, they, they basically move so fast that they actually in some sense tell the predator that if you want to catch me, it's not so easy for you to catch me. You will have to really, you will also probably have to move at the same speed as, as it is there. And it's a safety in numbers there, right? So these are some of the things uh, how they do that thing. We might think animals are the only one. Have you heard of something known as a wood wide web, web? Like a world wide web, www, this is something how plants communicate with each other. And this is a theory that has been around only for last 20, 25 years. Until last 20, 25 years, we didn't even know how plants communicate with each other. But there is a very sophisticated fungi based uh, mechanism. Uh, it's, it's known as a my, mycelium uh, based network. And what they do is that the trees actually communicate with each other. Now again, you have to understand the thing. A plant's basic, the core purpose of the roots of a plant is to provide enough nutrition here so that the plants survive. But what scientists have found out is that plants actually, so if, if this plant sees that this plant does not have enough nutrition, guess what? This plant will actually signal a very sophisticated way to send more carbon its way. There are, there are proven scientific experiments where they have found that if there is a mother tree with child tree, right? So these are really the ones that have come out of that mother tree. And the mother tree is able to see that one of the child tree is in distress it is able to send more carbon their way through the mycelial network so that that uh, ch child tree can survive. Again, there is a high, unusually high level of collaboration happening between the living beings, which normally we would not even be aware of, right? So these are some of the things. Uh, so what's happening here? Let's just uh, take a step back and see. Why are these individual members of species collaborating instead of competing for resources? How do they manage to orchestrate their individual behaviors in favor of a single collective behavior? 
and is it limited to some social insects, animals and birds or might also apply to humans? What do you guys think? I'll just take a pause here for a moment. What do you guys think? Any thoughts on that? Yes. The locusts travel in 80, 80, 80 million locusts in a square kilometer, and then Volvo was in fact studying the neural network as to how do they not collide with each other. Right, right. And it's a bit, as we get more autonomous and uh, drones and other kind of a thing, that's, that knowledge is going to become very important for us. Right, yeah. So, but why do they even decide to collaborate with each other? Why not simply take the food, whatever is there, because that's what ultimately every human, every organism wants to survive. Maybe they are more Sounds vulnerable than their immunity. Okay, so. Their chances are better if they follow rather than compete. I mean, they are okay, so that is a thought process. Let us see that. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other I thought process? The moment, moment that individual success starts, I think that starts a phase of a vulnerability chain that can bring them all down. Okay, so let us see. Let us examine uh, some of these. Last question Do you think this can apply to human beings? Yeah. Are we too selfish? Yeah. We are too selfish? Yes. Then we do that? Okay, let us examine some of these. This, this is also already getting applied in the AA field, right? For machine learning in AA, it's a swarm intelligence we call. Yeah, so swarm intelligence is actually one of the behaviors that we are now to beginning to understand and see that. Uh, but uh, the AI is obviously our program that we can program and uh, expect them to do something. But as human beings, do, do you think like this room full of people can ever get to any level of cooperation like that? Is that a reasonable thing? Yeah. Or are we too selfish? Yeah, so I, I think what she said, for example, if there is a common threat that probably unites us, let us let's see that, right? We will see some examples. So obviously, Darwin favored competition, right? Darwin said survival of the fittest, right? So how do you be the fittest? Because obviously, you are competing for food, mates and resources. So obviously, you have to basically uh, 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 adapt to the change and there could be a fight for it, right? Because you are trying to protect your own turf there. Uh, but uh, so how do we explain intra-species cooperation, right? Because a lot of these examples that we saw are intra-species, not inter-species, but intra-species. Within the same species, they are uh, cooperating. So how do they do that? And if you look at Dawkins, he talked about the selfish gene, right? Uh, some people might be familiar with this uh, uh, the seminal book, The Selfish Gene, where the point Richard Dawkins said was that it is the gene which really wants to protect itself. And it finds out a way in which the gene will get passed down to the offsprings, right? So the whole thinking was that it is, it is a, if, if there are enough number of uh, uh, what, what they call as phenotypes who are really protecting the genes, then it will get passed down to the next uh, generation there, right? It still does not fully explain the altruistic nature really on why people or why species should work together. It still gives a feeling that I should be very selfish in how really I am doing it because end of the day it, what matters is me, right? So that is the kind of a thing. Uh, now a lot of uh, this has been a, a, a subject matter of study for a long period of time and the whole perspective is, I will just read this one, despite the principle of survival of the fittest, the ultimate criteria which determines whether a gene is, will spread or not, whether the behavior is to the benefit of the behavior but whether it is the benefit of the gene itself. With altruism, this will happen only if the affected individual is a relative of the altruist, therefore having an increased chance of carrying the gene. So altruism is happening there, but as long as I see that maybe you and I, we have the same gene, then maybe there is going to be an altruism there. So there is some kind of a theory that seems to uh, bring, bring that perspective there. I will skip that one because I think this is too much of detail on that. But let us jump into this whole thing of whatever we are seeing, let us try to create a language around that. We have been calling it a super organism. The term itself is not very new actually. The term is at least 200 year old. It was actually created by a guy named James Hutton. He was the father of geology and he, he coined the term back in 1789. But uh, very famous entomologist, the guy who studies ants, uh, Wheeler, he actually created it. And the whole idea of super organism is something that is a combination of a lot of individual elements but behaves like a full element by itself, right? So when organisms of same species come together for a common purpose and behave as if they were a single organism, they accomplish the same task as the individual organism but with far less processing power. It is a very important thing and I will explain you what that means, which means that if per unit the power consumption 
or the calorie consumption of one living organism was x, if 100 of them come there, it is not 100 x, it is less than 100. We believe that this could be a reason that explains why they come together because it is a more energy efficient way for the species to operate there, right. So, we will see that thing and um, it was initially applied to what is some known as a U social element, uh, insects, U social U means good, right. So, these are the these are the good good social like ants and termites and honey bees, these are what is known as U social uh, insects for example. They are able to scale, this is the one, one of the interesting part of it. The biomass of ants in the world is probably the same as human beings and the biomass of termites is 27 times more than the human beings. But have you ever seen carbon dioxide poisoning killing termites? Have you ever seen traffic jams happening in the world of ants and termites and honeybees? We do not see that. But we human beings with the same biomass as ants are not able to build a sustainable planet. We are clearly getting something wrong. Most of the time the scale up, we talk of scaling up in agile, we have to slap a lot of frameworks on the top of it, otherwise we cannot even seem to scale up, right. And yet these ants and termites and honeybees can scale up to millions and millions of them without needing any layer of infrastructure around them. So what is it that we can learn from uh, them? And that is the whole uh, subject of uh, superorganism. Now how do the superorganism, what are their characteristics? One of the interesting characteristics, the first and foremost is something that we call as division of labor. In fact, a lot of us believe that Agile and Scrum in particular is a very egalitarian organization, right? There is no hierarchy, there is no uh, senior, junior, all that thing, right? Let me also make it a little more provocative. We also believe that there is no caste inside a Scrum team. Well, guess what? Nature actually has something that biologists call as caste. It may not please a lot of us sitting here, but nature actually has this concept and if you for example look at ants, there are primarily three kinds of ants. There is, uh, uh, there is the, the queen, uh, which uh, queen is not the boss of it incidentally as some of you know. Queen is only known as queen because she lays the eggs. And the only reason why a female ant will become queen is because she is fed more. No other reason. So they just have an infinite capacity literally because they can lay eggs for like 20 years actually in some cases. Then uh, you, have the, you have the infertile workers, these are typically the female workers and the male as you can imagine from the human species they do not do much here. <laughs> I mean in most of the cases their only job is procreation and nothing else and in many species they are actually eaten up by the female as soon as the copulation happens. Bite their head. Was that? They bite their head. They bite their head off and they are like protein, that is it, nothing more than that. But then there is a division of labor clearly along the reproductive and non-reproductive lines which actually give them the social status inside a beehive or inside an ant colony or inside a terminate mound. So nature actually does not think everybody is equal. Nature does not say that there has to be egalitarian in everything there. There are clearly roles which are genetically pre-adapted, we come hardwired with some of these roles there. And Nature does not make a big deal of that, but that is exactly how the how it is seen there. The second uh, big idea there is what is known as eusociality. The eusociality essentially means good social. These are the and, and if, if you if you read about sociology, this is the highest form of sociality. And what it means, it is very simple three things. One is cooperative brood care. Essentially, what it means is they take care of their young. Simple, simple uh, English. Second is overlapping generations. They can have a grand, grandparents and a parent and a child generation all living together there. And thirdly, they have a reproductive division of labor. Now, biologists call any of them insects having this kind of a thing as a eusocial uh, behavior there. Again, the key, the key thing is why do they have, why do they do this kind of a thing? Uh, uh, out of the entire animal kingdom, only about one, uh, only about two dozen insects and animals actually show this kind of a behavior. Not everyone shows that, but those who show, they show some uh, these common traits in, in each of them. They show another thing, something known as a collective intelligence. You talked about the swarm intelligence, something like that. We are beginning to see where we are talking about how instead of one single one single brain being the source of insights, there is there is this whole thinking of collectivism and how do we really work together uh, uh, there to do this kind of a thing. They are a, a more consensus driven uh, decision making. I talked about energy efficient, this is a very interesting graph actually known as uh, uh, Kleber's law. Uh, uh, I am sure none of you studied biology, I actually flunked in my biology in 12th class. 
uh, whatever biology I am talking about is my own self interest, otherwise I am not even qualified to speak on that. So this is something which actually was in 1930s, a biologist by name Kleber and what Kleber discovered was a very interesting thing actually. What he found was that as the body weight of, uh, of uh, uh, animals keeps increasing, the power consumption that is the amount of calories they need actually is uh, is it scales three fourth to the power of animal's mass. So if you start here, you will basically see there is a mouse, there is a rat here, there is a rabbit, there is a dog, there is an elephant and there is a whale. In biological terms, you can almost predict uh, if you are given an animal and if you are given the mass of that animal, you can almost predict what kind of a calorific requirement it would have there. So it's a very interesting thing that as the animal size grows bigger, it does not need linearly same amount of energy per unit size. It needs lesser energy. It is more efficient actually. That is why some of the longer, some of the bigger animals live longer. The blue sperm whale is supposed to live for 90 years or 100 years. Elephants are supposed to have lived to 80 to 100 years because their calorific requirements are not the same as their body mass linearly would be. Compared to the smaller animals, for example, a mouse might live only a few years or a couple of years, for example, a rat or, or a guinea pig or a rabbit or a dog might go to 20 years, but an elephant or a sperm whale would go up to 80 to 100 years there. Why is it important in this point here? Well, what they have found is that this, this so-called super organism also shows the same behavior, which means that if there was one single insect if that insect required energy x and if there are a million of them, they would not require 1 million x, they would require 3 fourths of a million x. It has a huge implication because that tells that coming together makes you more energy efficient. So there is a reason why they come together because a lot of, and I will give you little, little more graphic examples to explain what I mean with that. But the whole idea there is that it, it takes a lot of sense for them to be together rather than being alone there, their survival chances are much better there. And, and then they, they show this uh, whole idea of self-organization where, where the key thing, in agile terms we always call of self-organization. I personally believe we agilists do not even understand what is self-organization. We all need to go to a bio, biology class or, or, or read biomimicry or, or listen to some of the stuff there from complex adaptive systems to even begin, begin to appreciate what is really self-organization there. I will not have time to really go into details on that, but uh, this is uh, there. But the key idea is, I think, what we all get intuitively. The system without any external uh, 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 impetus is internally able to realign and readjust itself and reorganize itself. Somebody talked of shape-shifting. It is in a physical sense, but it essentially is, what we are saying is, it is able to realign its energies or actions to restore the balance or go back and kind of uh, go back to the old status quo. If not, uh, if not, I mean it, it doesn't really just become a sitting duck, that kind of a thing there. Uh, swarm creativity is something which is beginning to happen there. We, I think the closest example that we can see is Wikipedia and open source is a great example of swarm creativity. Nobody is really creating a master plan in some sense, but then it is basically the participants who are guiding the whole thing there. So that's the kind of a char characteristic we are seeing uh, here also. Uh, so how do we decode superorganisms? One reference that I want to give is this lovely book, Teeming, uh, written by Dr. Uh, Tamsin Wooley Barker. And she has actually, over the years of her research, she has found these 12 patterns of what really superorganisms are all about and how can we really do that. What I am trying to do in the next few slides is just take a reference for them in the human context and see how they can, how we can really do some of them. So the question is, is there a possibility of a human superorganism? Can we apply a lot of these ideas to really make more productive teams, more resilient organizations, more effective and high performing human groups, right? These are some of the questions that I want to do. And the, and the perspective that we want to do is something that, that is known as in Latin is e pluribus unum. Uh, has anyone heard of this phrase? So what it means is from many one. And it's exactly like, for example, a bouquet of flowers. You could have a lot of flowers there that are basically individual there, but the value is much, much different. They, they still are made of uh, uh, many, but, but the bouquet itself still looks like the flower uh, bunch there. Uh, and it was actually adopted as the, uh, as a, so if you, have a, if you have a dollar or a quarter dollar coin, every US dollar coin or a bill actually has this written on them. US was founded by the founding fathers on this paradigm 
that we want to become a become a country where everybody comes together as one and not really uh, kind of have running in different direction so just to just to give a perspective on that one so let's look at some of the uh, some of the examples uh, where probably we might be a human super organism i don't know i i want to have a dialogue with all of you here do you think a human pyramid is a is a super organism it 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 i mean it right it, it it's all coming together it's behaving like one single thing there is probably no central controller it is evolving there is a self organizing behavior there because if 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 it is tilting you cannot predict the wind at that point in time maybe the wind is swaying the whole thing there and the team probably has to do something else to kind of do a self correction there right so some of that stuff might be happening for all we know as as the human pyramid is getting formed there uh, yes they might have practiced they might have done that kind of a stuff but at that point in time it is a new deal right they they, they are they are probably kind of uh, trying to do that thing not until maybe the third layer guys say the guys from north india you have south india stamping on them then, then the whole thing falls there right yeah 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 <laughs> and you know that my favorite thing of north and south is i'm a north indian who has been living in south now i consider myself as a bangalorean but when you are a north indian anything below mumbai is a madrasi yeah. and if you are a south indian anything yeah. above mumbai is a punjabi yeah. right so we we are very simple people we have we have divided the world in just two simple things right so human pyramid okay what about a pedestrian crossing is anyone familiar with this shibuya crossing shibuya crossing is the world's busiest crossing in tokyo it is it it's it's like it is it's taken as a case study maybe i i think we need to learn from it in bangalore right um, do you think this is this could be a super organism i don't know it does behave like a very different kind of a thing it does seem to have some kind of a like if it was as if one one single mass of people was kind of like doing it or people had their own kind of a thing there the queue seems to form people just people intuitively nobody tells them to go like this people just seem to automatically form lanes people just seem to have there is there nobody who's really setting the order at for the whole group there but inside people just form those chains and they just kind of follow the whole thing there right so it could be it could be an example of what a, what uh, a super organism could be what about an emergency room everybody is a specialist in that every doctor anesthetist nurse everybody is there but uh, i hope none of you have ever been to an emergency being treated by the doctors but if you have had a chance to watch some of the movies or something they work like a swiss clockwork right they there's like tak 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 as if they have probably rehearsed the whole script millions of times and yet they cannot predict what the next patient will come with they work like a single unit they work like so again now you might some of you might argue and say that it doesn't seem to cut a lot of ice right because uh, so so for example not everybody is because in scrum we are we love the whole phrase of uh, self organizing and uh, right and we go into this whole fungibility fungibility i mean if you are if you are a leader you are a vp or a director you love this term fungible right and then the second term you love is resources nothing gives you more pleasure than calling human beings as resources and then when you add it together you say fungible resources that means oh today you are doing front end tomorrow you can do back end what is the big deal about it there's no difference a programming is a programming right so you can do that kind of a thing there now you might think that hey in in scrum i know that the whole idea is a cross functional team where everybody is a generalizing specialist so anybody can because we have something known as open allocation that means i can bid for it and say okay i want to do database work in this or next time i want to do back end work on that one and and in theory people should be fungible so they are able to do the whole stuff there well in reality even biologically we are not like that whatever your leg can do your hand cannot do whatever your hand can do your eyes cannot do that is how the nature has created us that's exactly it doesn't mean that simply that we should consider ourselves as my hand and my eyes are irreplaceable my hands can see and my eyes can feed me I and mean, that doesn't that's crazy right so same way even if this is a self contained self organizing fully autonomous team it does not mean that the job of anesthetist anesthetist can be done by the radiologist and the job of radiologist can be done by the head nurse everybody has a place to play they might be self organizing but that does not mean that they will genetically change what they are pre adapted to do they are already hardwired to do some of that kind of stuff so remember that thing but th that constraints aside they still work together as a cohesive unit uh, as if you would not be able to say right any change come anything comes the whole unit responds as a single unit not like a very fragmented kind of uh, group of human beings there 
What about a cycle, cycling peloton? Have you heard of this term, peloton? I'm sure if you have watched Lams Armstrong on steroids uh, going, <laughs> going through the French uh, mountains, uh, you would have seen that uh, uh, there, is, there is this group of cyclists that actually comes together and there might be a, an Armstrong here somewhere actually. And this formation is known as a peloton and it's a very interesting thing. So what peloton does is that most of these people are not even competing with a Lance Armstrong. They are, they are only helping Lance Armstrong. How are they doing it? The guy who is here is actually taking the maximum draft on himself. Because he will get exhausted if he, so he is a pace setter and he will get exhausted and he will drop off his, he is not even in the race. He is what is a pace setter. And Lance Armstrong is preserving energy. The fact that he is a part of this peloton gives him the ability to go because there is no wind resistance that is uh, against him. These guys are taking it, but he is able to actually enjoy it and later on, when, when the right time comes there, the peloton goes away and this guy just zooms in. He takes one more steroids and goes there. <laughs> right? That kind of stuff there. Is that a super organism? It's behaving in a very different manner, but it's behaving like a very cohesive unit. It is, is it competing with each other? It's collaborating. Most of the people are showing unusually altruistic behavior of helping Lance Armstrong win the race there. They themselves are not worried about fame or glory or money. Right? They might get some money, but definitely not fame or glory. You will not even know who they were. But that's how a peloton works. What about a Mexican wave? Would you call a Mexican wave as a super organism? Who, who, who decides, okay, now you guys will do, now you guys will do, now you guys will do? It just starts. You, you watch people, one set of people decides to do that, and then the whole uh, stadia transforms into a Mexican, a giant uh, circular Mexican wave there, right? So it's a behavior which is spontaneous, random. It is what we call as in complex systems, uh, we cannot predict the next state, we cannot predict the past state. There is no centralized controller. It's an emergent behavior. In this particular case, it's a kind of a repetitive thing, but a swarm is also something like that. It's just that the swarm decides at that point in time to, to kind of uh, go there. What about a flash mob? Now, it's possible that a lot of time flash mobs are pre-rehearsed in reality. That's fine. That's perfectly okay. But despite that, uh, they, they, they may may not always been the case. I mean, nowadays, it, if you are really creating it as a performing event, then it might be pre-rehearsed. But conceptually, when it came, the whole idea was that you have a group of people who are just basically coming together and they just start spontaneously uh, coordinating and synchronizing their, uh, the, the, their dance movements there, right? What about mosh pit? Anyone has been in a mosh pit? Anyone is familiar with the idea? Okay, so this is not an Indian phenomenon. I learned it from my son actually because he's in college in US, so I learned it from him. So what happens is this, these are the heavy rock stuff there. And uh, if you watch it on, on uh, YouTube, you should watch some of this stuff. This is crazy. All of us will go wild actually. So what happens is that guy is singing heavy rock and all that thing. And there is two group of people, they come and bang against each other. It's like the Ramanan Sagar Mahabharat kind of a thing there, right? It's like people just come, it's like thousands of people just come and bang into each other there. They are behaving, they are all going thousand people like that. Uh, I don't know uh, if, if, if it causes injuries or even deaths, but people do it actually. So mosh pit is something like that, which you have to see to believe it. You have been inside, so you probably have more idea than the uh, rest of us here. But uh, this is like, you have, so you have thousand people, nobody is telling anything, nobody is centrally guiding it. People are just waiting in anticipation. And actually, if you think of it, there is no real difference between how these people in the mosh pit are behaving then the birds, a million birds flying with each other. So there is a guy by name Craig Reynolds. In 78, he created this algorithm known as Boyd's. So he started saying that, hey, how do I really simulate the birds flying there? And he created a very simple algorithm. He created a program Boyd's with three simple rules. And that three simple rule is actually able to explain exactly how birds fly without colliding with each other. The first one was maintain the same distance as the bird in front of you. Very logical, right? You don't need to be, uh, have a nuclear physics PhD to do that. Second is, I mean, like you maintain equidistance with your neighbors. Second is maintain the same speed. And that's the guidance that you give for, to people driving on a highway, right? Your highway limit is uh, 55 miles, but if the other guy is traveling at 80 miles, you don't want to be at 55 and get become a roadkill, right? Even DMV, like in US, if you are driving, DMV will say, hey, even though there is a speed limit, but it says that you follow the lane speed, what people are doing, otherwise you will create a traffic there. 
So the birds follow exactly the same thing actually. Right? So these are two or three simple principles with which they have been able to do. If you look at mosh pit, that's probably the same thing happening there. All people are doing is they are just following the guy or the girl in front of them and they are doing at the same pace and they are just following the whole thing. And, and this is uh, kind of happening there. What about a skydiving formation? The skydiving formation could be, for example, they might, I mean, there's only so much you can practice. This was the world record, 200 people in a single uh, formation there. But then they might have a high level kind of an idea of what they want to do, but that at, at that point in time, how they are self-organizing, how do they are coming together, we cannot predict it. It's a complex adaptive system. We cannot predict what is the next state, right? There is th this kind of a thing there. I would even, uh, anyone has heard of Burning Man? Burning Man is a great example of how impromptu human groups come together. So every year in the month of July, August, sometime, well, about 100,000 people come together. It's, it's, it's nowhere in the middle of a desert in Nevada where they come there and they start creating this kind of a township where they live there. There is no economy at that point in time. It is what is an exchange economy. That means you, can, you only can barter stuff there. You cannot buy. I think, I believe the only thing you can buy is water and ice cream. Everything else is a barter stuff there. So, and people live there for a week like that in the middle of it and then they burn a big, big uh, uh, thing they call as the burning man. And the height of that keeps going up all the time. Who organizes it? Who creates the whole thing there? Who tells people how to really do this kind of a thing? It's all, it's all, and, and they are behaving as one single organism which might be doing the same kind of a thing there, right? So I, I would even argue that this, this is a great example of a group which is doing. I would even argue Kumbh Mela is like that. I had a chance to go to Kumbh Mela this year and I saw like literally, literally crores of people there and it was an exceptionally well organized event there. Uh, I mean, I did study at Allahabad long back, but that was long back. I, I went after almost 30 years and I saw amazing stuff, nothing. I mean, whatever I had uh, conceptions about what it was and what it used to be, it is like people are behaving themselves. So the system is actually being respected by the individuals there. You have, you literally have millions and millions of people there, but they are behaving as if one single organism might be actually uh, uh, doing it in the right way rather than unruly groups here and there, which is kind of becoming it. So I think these are, to me, these are some great examples of how uh, it could be. So how do we bring some of that um, into this? Uh, I just want to take a leaf from uh, Project Aristotle. Project Aristotle was the project that Google did to really say, how do we make great teams? If you look at uh, what they found basically was that great teams have five things. They have this whole thing of psychological safety. So they basically see the team members fa feel safe to take the risk there. They feel that there is this whole sense of uh, mutual altruism. Nobody is going to stab me if I do something out there, that kind of a thing there. So second is dependability. They can get <coughs> things done on time because they are depending on each other there. Imagine a beehive in which there are some uh, or any kind of an uh, eusocial insect species where some are working outside getting the food, they are foraging the food and some are working inside cleaning up the whole thing. Unless that kind of a trust is there, it's probably not going to work out. Structure and clarity, team members have clear goals, plans and, and, and uh, roles. Everybody has a clear role there, they know exactly what is to be done there. Again, biology has made it that there is a natural division of labor. And that is exactly how uh, then, then the, uh, the, these animals and insects decide to do. Meaning work is personally important to the team members. Now I don't know who does the all hands in, in a beehive to basically say, hey guys, now we are going to go for the, there is a new sunflower farm that has come up there in the west of, uh, uh, of Rajaji Nagar. Let's go and attack there. I don't know who does that kind of a thing. But then they still have a basic survival thing in terms of protecting the queen because that is the way their progenies will, will live for, uh, for a long period of time. So that's very clear. Biologically, they are done that. And finally, the impact, they know exactly what they are doing it. So I think to, to a large extent, I can see that there are commonalities with uh, some of these ideas of superorganism in how the human groups can be made, which are into effective and high performing kind of a groups uh, there. Uh, let me just wrap it up here. Uh, I, I find the whole idea of superorganism very intriguing, very interesting kind of a thing there. Uh, while it's very easy for us to, to look at a framework and say, oh, that is how things should be. But I think we are forgetting one single thing that that is how nature has already built us out actually. And if we can learn from some of these ideas and we can bring it to the workplace, it would be a great opportunity for us to leverage because like biomimicry, someone talked about biomimicry 3.8 is actually a great uh, site. And the reason why uh, uh, Benin, uh, 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 Jenny Benius calls it as 3.8 is because 
mother nature has already perfected it for 3.8 billion years that life has been around on earth. So these are some of the design patterns that we have already seen in earth, on earth because of which we have survived this long there and like, like the fungal network for the plants that I talked about, they came before the plants happened on, on earth. They have been around for half a billion years. So these are some of the patterns that have evolved. They have like, if, 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 if you look at uh, the, the, uh, the ants, they have been around for about 150 million years. Termites have been around for about 250 million years. So they have survived a lot of geographical extinctions and these kind of a things and still they keep going strong. These ants have spread all over the place there, right, all over the earth. So obviously there is a lot of value in us being able to understand on some of these things. And I think if we bring and distill some of them, uh, these ideas, it would be great opportunity for us to build resilient teams that can actually uh, behave like a super organism and not just pieces of uh, fungible resources over there, right. Thank you. I think we have run out of time, but I'm happy to chat later. Thank you. <laughs>